You know what I just realized? I've referenced in my last couple of casts of professional games of StarCraft 2 that we have a new world champion in SC2, but I've not casted a single game of the man just yet ever since BlizzCon wrapped up. So today we're gonna change that. It's time for an epic match of Zerg versus Protoss. Spawning here in the bottom right-hand corner of Winter's Gate LE, playing with the Red Zerg drones from South Korea. We have none other than the current world champion of SC2, we're looking inside of the main of Dark. Ridiculously good player, very, very successful career, very consistent results as well throughout 2019. I'll quickly go over those in just a little bit because spawning here in the opposite corner, playing with the blue Protoss pieces. An absolute Protoss powerhouse from Germany. He's known as the Mauer, but his actual nickname is Showtime. Alrighty. So like I mentioned, right, Dark is a very consistent professional gamer. He's been around for many years, and this year alone, he's actually had a ton of really good results. So in March, he got semifinals IEM Katowice. In April, he got semifinals GSL Code S Season 1. In June, he won the GSL Code S Season 2. He got semifinals at the GSL Code S in September, in Season 3, obviously. Then he won the GSL Super Tournament in October, and then very recently, in November, he won the WCS Global Finals. He won the World Championship Series. Much deserved victory. He showed some stellar games. And this is actually a match from that tournament as well. Now, I know that this is an epic game. I don't really remember the details of it, so we're gonna figure it out together. Because apparently Showtime right here decides to go for a Forge ridiculously early. This does get scouted immediately by Dark, but this map, yeah, this map is really, really good when it comes to cannon rushes because you can block your opponent from entering this area right over here. So photon cannons are almost always guaranteed to go up. And if Shotem wants to, he can even cancel that last pylon. We'll see if more drones get pulled. He's gonna go ahead and just plant down the second, uh, the second photon cannon. And with that, I mean, right now Dark knows that this is a very committed push. Even a second probe was sent across the map. What is the response gonna be here for the Zerg? So it is gonna be apparently a fourth drone in gas, a little bit of a mistake there. And also a spine crawler, a second spine crawler now also coming up on the edge of the creep. He's probably gonna edge them over here in just a little bit. Um, obviously on this map, there is that nice high ground over here where you can position those spines, right? So I'm assuming that's what Dark wants to go for. There are two queens coming up. He did already take the second gas, which he now decides to go ahead and cancel. Instead, it looks like he just simply wants to go ahead and grab the third base. Queen is going to lay down a tumor over here. But I kind of would like to see Showtime adding on like a pylon over here, right? If you get a pylon right over here, you can actually force high ground vision. Although now with that probe gone, I mean, it's not going to be the case anymore. The hatchery obviously will fall. But the question is, is this going to be a favorable trait? So this is one of the reasons why cannon rushes in general are not considered to be that great at the highest level of SC2. Yeah. Two sports were forced out right here, so that's two drones going down as well as 200 minerals. Obviously, a drone fell from making that hatchery too, and then 300 minerals for the hatchery as well. But all things considered, right? Is this really a bad position for the Zerg to be in? I think the main advantage and the reason why this is a, a good ladder build in general is that a lot of Zerg players absolutely freak out and they don't know how to respond to this or they don't really realize how much it costs for a Protoss player to execute something like this, right? Now, in reality, there we go. Dark is just going to once again take his base. There's a spine crawler that's moving down towards the low ground as well. A couple of Zerklings in the mineral line are going to shoo away that Adept. I showed them, did see that that was the case. Stargate is coming up, but I think that this response right here from Dark was very calm, very collected. Two more pylons are certainly going to fall as well. And once they do, we should have a look real quick at what the actual result of this aggression is going to be. So it's going to be a Void Ray as a follow-up right now too. I think that's primarily to deal with any kind of potential, like, for example, Nidus follow-up. Very, very easy to snipe those overlords with that, uh, with that Void Ray, obviously. So here we go. Who really came out ahead there? Look at this. I mean, you gotta take into account that two spine crawlers were made as well, and obviously a bunch of drones also ended up dying, so this is not telling the whole story. But there's no denying that photon cannons... Are oh my god, he's bringing the spines. <sighs> there's no denying that photon cannons are extremely expensive, and he's kind of just throwing them away. There's a Nidus network coming up right now. Dark is utilizing those two spine crawlers that he produced as a response by moving them across the map. Now, the Void Ray was spotted there. There's an Oracle coming up as well. Probe is actually patrolling back and forth just to make sure that nothing goes without Showtime being aware of it. But yeah, these two spines, I mean, they're gonna have a hard time making their way across the map and rooting anywhere without creep. So we'll see what Dark wants to do with that. Okay, Nidus Worm is coming up. Is this spotted? 
just barely outside of the vision range right there of Showtime. He is going to see this Overlord from coming up, so he does know the timing of the uh, of the Nidus Worm precisely. Good kill there. Question is, though, what is he going to do against this army right over here, right? So the Spines are coming forward. The Queens are already in position as well. They know, obviously, where that Void Ray was located. But this is going to be a slow and steady push. It's going to give Showtime more than enough time here to start producing a couple of these shield batteries. Oracle's pretty good in this kind of scenario. I wouldn't even mind seeing him go for the counterattack, although a Spore Crawler uh, has been set up in the middle line too. It's going to be tricky though. I mean, Oracles are always a little bit vulnerable, right? Okay. So there we go. Good Transfuse. He's going to pop it back into the Nidus. Save that one. Pop it out, Transfuse. Excellent control here so far by Dark, which is obviously what we do expect from someone at this level of play, but Showtime opening up very, very aggressively. Didn't really get that much damage done despite killing the Hatch. Right now, he's gonna have to deal with a Nidus inside of his main base too, and Dark certainly is looking to lay down the law. These two spine crawlers, man, they have had a journey. Obviously, they uh, certainly were a very expensive investment here, but now with the Nidus in the main base, that's where the aggression is gonna root from Dark is forcing his opponent right now to move into that main base. Showtime immediately does evacuate the probes on out of there. Absolutely critical here that a hatchery, or rather a nexus, does not fall and that as many probes stay alive as possible. Oracle's mostly out of energy here. Decent control so far here for Showtime, keeping the majority of these units alive. A lot of Zerklings are falling here. They do get some decent trades against these, uh, against these Protoss units, but is this really enough damage right now? Reinforcing links are coming up. 12 more Zerklings are produced as well. There's actually one queen that certainly would like to jump into that Nidus Worm too. Main base taking an awful lot of damage right now. Probes from the mineral line in a natural pool to fight inside of the main base. What? You run out of Marines? I mean, that's what probes would say, obviously, if they could talk. And if there were Marines. What? You run out of Zealots? That's 14 probes going down here, but the Nexus still lives. Void Ray falls there as well, though. That extra queen adding on a lot of additional DPS. Zerklings will spawn here in a second, but I think that Showtime managed to hold on by the skin of his teeth with the Nexus alive. And in the grand scheme of things, yeah, he lost 14 probes. But if you look right now at the amount of workers available, there's 20 or 27 right now for the Protoss. That is an advantage here. Now, it looks like Dark is not done yet, although I don't really see exactly what he could continue with. There is a full wall over here, so it's a little bit awkward. That spine crawler actually has more range than all of these Protoss units. There's a Roach Warren coming up right now as well. Night is Worm inside of the main base. Dark actually decides to contaminate the main Nexus too. Pylon falls. But here we go. With that, Showtime is going to be able to get some units out of that natural. He's trying to produce a couple of probes here. Night is in the main base. Man, this is such a nuisance. Dark is ridiculously good at this multitasking. How many queens did he lose up to this point? None. So all of the queens actually uh, have lived up to this point in the game. That's pretty ridiculous. Obviously, these uh, these Nidus's are pretty expensive, right? It's not like you just simply throw those out. I mean, they're only 50-50, but he's lost uh, he's lost like 10 of them at this point. Spine Crawler in the natural of the Protoss still alive and kicking. There's actually a couple of cheeky creep tubers being spread towards the natural. That's the sickest scouting mechanic here for Dark. There's no detection. Actually, if one of them finishes, okay, that's lucky there. If one of them finishes, that would actually be uh, that would actually be pretty ridiculous. But um, I think that this aggression has now mostly been shut down, and with a very eventful eight minutes, it looks like the Protoss and the Zerg player both have stabilized. All right, so where are we at right now? Well, you know what? Worker-wise, pretty much even. Small advantage here for Protoss. This is where that Chrono Boost is extremely helpful. We just have a regular three hatch right here for Zerk. The natural obviously was taken. It's Lings and Roaches right now for the time being for uh, for Dark. There's not a Nidus Worm coming up as well. But if you skip the first nine minutes of this game, I mean, you probably would have assumed that this is just your regular like five minute mark or so uh, in, a, in a normal match of ZVP. Oh, well, I guess except for the amount of creep that's, uh, that's right outside of the base of the Protoss player. There's one cheeky little changeling pretending to be a, a zealot. I'm actually really impressed that Showtime did not lose that Nexus. Would have been so easy there to pull either too many probes or lose too many probes or lose the Nexus or both. Very easy to make a small error. By the way, two drones fell. Uh, I guess that was like an adept or something along those lines. But anyways, um, really, really interesting early game here. And, uh, well, I guess right now we're going to be setting ourselves up for what seems to be a, a pretty normal game. Would love to see an Observer, by the way. Yeah, I think that Showtime would love to see one of those as well. 
those tumors really need to go. This is so much scouting information that Dark gets. And you can see Dark is just simply trying to make as many workers as possible. He's squeezing in a couple of roaches here and there, but really not that many. Really not that many. All right, there we go. A little bit of spring cleaning here in the middle of the winter. I'm curious to see where this game is going to go from here, because I honestly do not remember. I just, I just, so, so once again, right, this was played, um, I believe during the round of 16, which was played at 4 a.m. over here in Europe. Now, I did watch the games live, but, uh, I watched them live for, like, uh, for, like, four days straight, if I'm not mistaken, and, uh, my sleep schedule was a mess. I was essentially jet-lagged from my own home. <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. I just woke up to watch StarCraft. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a little while already. I just remember that this game was amazing. I made a note of it. I'm happy to be casting it. Winter's Gate. It always does create some interesting games, right? So in the next latter season, this map will be gone. The big slowing zones. Pro gamers hate them. I don't like playing on it either. But it does create some epic, epic games. As an observer, this is the kind of map that you uh, like. If, if you're like a viewer of StarCraft, right? This is the kind of the kind of map that you probably enjoy watching the most. Just because it's a little bit different, then you get these crazy wacky strategies where both players try and just simply uh, jump at each other's throats. But, uh, you know, at this level of play, apparently just jumping at each other's throat is not enough. Anyways, I do think, though... So, so some people ask, right? We've been talking about this quite a, quite a bit over at the live stream. Once again, by the way, we do see a Nidus Worm coming up. There's also an Infestation Pit, so I guess it's going to be Swarm Hosts in the Nidus Worm next. But some people have asked during the livestream, Loco, who do you think is better, Serral or Rogue? And it's an interesting question to ask, because yes, Dark did win the WCS. He did win the World Championship Series. Did lose a couple of games along the way as well. But he did, uh, he did win that whole tournament. However, I don't really know exactly if he would be better than Serral. If Serral would play, a, say, like a best of seven series against Dark, who would win? I would say Serral nine times out of ten. This is great, by the way, by Showtime. Ooh, nice little bit of damage. There's actually also a counter-attack coming up. A couple of Overlords misrallied. Nice pickings, actually, there for Showtime. He can certainly go for a push from here. Ooh. Yeah, once again. That's a lot of drones going down, though. Whew. There's Swarmos coming up, which is great. But uh, that is a lot of damage that was actually just dealt in a very small amount of time. Couple of roaches trying to see if they can intercept some of that Protoss army. He knows where it's located. So maybe he wants to move on over towards the other direction. Night is Worm going up right here on the right hand side of the map as well. Showtime sniffs it out. He knows that there's likely going to be Swarmos here in a second. 17 drones in total, by the way. That's a very significant amount. Dark desperately trying to put down a couple of those Nidus Worms. But so far, the Whack a Mole here from Showtime has been really, really good. He's looking for it once again. Should probably target it, mate. You should probably target it. There you go. These Immortals. They're going to be able to finish that one just in time. <sighs> Nicely done. The issue here, obviously, is if the uh, Swarmos get their Locust in, that would be a disaster. Anyways, um, the whole format of BlizzCon this year, I could make a dedicated video about that, because I honestly don't think it was very good. Basically, they, they did the round of 16 over in South Korea, which is obviously where Dark is from. And then they flew all of the pro gamers. Actually, hold that thought, because a big engagement is coming up, because one of the Nidus Worms did finish. That's a lot of locusts as well. How many... Oh my god, he's got 18 swarm hosts. That is his supply, obviously, extremely high right now. We'll see how uh, how Showtime decides to deal with it. Doesn't dodge any of those biles. Most of the Protoss units here do stay alive, however. And that now means that most of that Zerg army is on the retreat. But obviously, by the time he gets across, I feel like he's going to be in a... You know, he's going to be in a pretty good spot again because the locusts will come off cooldown. Queen's still holding the perimeter. Nidus Worm here goes down, and you know what? That was actually a good move for Shota. It was actually really sweet for him. Um, usually against Nidus play, or rather against Nidus Swarm Host play, um, if Protoss manages to go up to, like, say, like 170-ish supply, they become significantly more confident playing against this. Because it's really just a numbers game here, right? So Swarm Host gain value if you, like, keep the Protoss player contained around, like, say, like 120 or so supply. That's where Swarm Host really seem to shine at, at, at their best, right? So right now, that is an awful lot of Protoss already. If he can get, like, a couple of Stormy Boys in there as well, there's no, uh, 
There's actually no storms just yet. He's probably just gonna go for another arc one there. He does. But here we go. That's a big engagement. The Locust dealing a lot of damage. War Prism desperately trying to pick up some of these weakened units as well. Once again, good. The Dodge is there on the Biles. And of course, the Mauer holds. I mean, his nickname is literally the Wall. The Shield of Ire. Wait, no, that's stats. <laughs> but he's very, very strong defensively. Okay. So just, just warp in more stuff. Like, basically what he wants to do right now is just get a massive army going. Fourth Nexus here coming up as well in the grand scheme of things. Pretty impressive move there for Showtime to find the APM to go ahead and do so. Dark is already preparing right now for a switch as well. He knows that this counterattack for Protoss is going to be very, very hard to deal with. If he decides to actually send the Locust into the main base, though, there could be a lot of trouble. Uh, okay, yeah, he's just simply he's just simply going to unload the Swarm Host right over here at home because he needs them. Like, without the Swarm Host here, this army would absolutely get smashed. And beautiful pullback right there by Showtime. He knows he triggered the Locust. And he's like, okay, I'll run. I'll run. Well, I mean, you need to run. No, 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 don't fight. Don't fight. Run. Just run. Just wait until they're timed out, then fight again. I guess you can fight a little bit, maybe. Ah, it's so risky, though. Like, Swarm Hosts are such a difficult unit to deal with. Okay, but anyways, Lurkers are going to come up here. So, Dark kind of wants to get rid of a couple of these Swarm Hosts as well. You don't really want to keep them around for too, too long either. That's a scary Protoss ball, though. Right? That's a lot of Archons, a lot of Immortals. That juggling has been on point. Short time losing a couple here and there, but really not that many. Ooh, big Zealot warp in. No snipes there. No corrosive balls on that prism. Locus once again did come off cooldown, so he's going to run away. Yeah, he's going to have to run away. You can't just fight that army straight up. I think with that, there's probably going to be enough Zerg here to hold on. We'd love to see the switch right now, actually, as well, with this Lurker then finishing up to adding on a bunch of Lurkers. Lurkers are obviously very expensive in gas in particular. Hmm. Okay. So can I can I tell my, my BlizzCon story real quick now? And my thoughts about it? Okay, TLDR, okay? Long story short. Last year, they played the top 16 over in America, and they've done that every single time. So the top 16 was played over the course of like, I think four days, and then at BlizzCon itself, over the two days of BlizzCon, they decided to do the top eight initially, and then the top four and the finals, right? Well, once again, big Locust wave. This year around, though, they just simply did it over in Korea initially, and then they did all of the top four, or all of the top eight, rather, in one day. So that was a ridiculously long day, and Dark just simply turned out superior in that regard, but I wonder what it would have been like if it was similar to the last year for you. format. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. I got, I got the story out of the way. Uh, looks like Protoss is still holding on. You know what? I'm looking at the supply counts here, and usually there's a moment where either Protoss goes to like 170, and then all of a sudden the Swarm Hosts really don't do very much anymore, or Zerk just simply smashes an army and just gets a massive advantage. Right now it's a bit of a weird moment where Zerk is not getting too, too much done. Well, here we go. You see underneath that cloud of Overlords, that swarm of Overlords, I guess. A lot of uh, Zealots are charging forward. They're gonna get a little bit of damage done, but not too much. They're mostly just forcing this Zerg player back. In the meantime, there was a Nidus Worm that finished up over there. One Immortal's like, hey guys, what's up? <laughs> hey guys, how are you doing? Oh man. Okay, actually, the Immortal tried to bait some of that fire, the true warrior of ire. At the same time, we have the Protoss army actually standing right over here, trying to hold position as well. <sighs> The hatchery is still alive, and you know what? I don't think we can say that for the Nexus. The Nexus does fall, the Locusts die as well, but obviously the Locusts will come off cooldown again in just a little bit. Showtime loses a Nexus, did not kill a hatchery. And while he's warping in over here, he's keeping the Protoss or the Zerg player contained. His Whack-A-Mole play was strong. He lost control of one area of the map, and immediately he's down a Nexus. That's a really big hit. So right now, right? Yeah, we see the Hive tech here for Dark. He's already going up towards that Lurker upgrade, so the Lurker upgrade will allow it to burrow a little bit faster. Um, we see Dark just simply replacing the Swarm Host. There's still 17 of them remaining, but he's just simply replacing them whenever he can with Lurkers instead. And that is going to be an army that's very difficult to deal with. Dark's still looking for that juicy connection for the really strong engagement. Couple of Zealots over here do get warped in. They force the Council on that hatch. Nicely done. Showtime picked him up. There you go. He's a good carer of, uh, of his... Yeah, just drop him down again. I think that's fine. It's just so difficult for Protoss to deal with, right? Like, you're constantly on the defensive, and you make one mistake, and immediately these Locusts will get so much damage done. Like, they can kill a Nexus in the blink of an eye. Once again, though... Oh, uh, yeah, there's, there's Lurkers. 
I mean, if you're fighting the Protoss army... Oh, good storms. Good storms, actually. That's going to kill them very easily. If you're fighting the, the, the Protoss army without those Locusts, like, like, present, you're actually in some trouble. But right now, since most of the Protoss army, right? Well, pretty much all of the Protoss army here is dedicated to ground units. Lurkers just simply shine. There's also this really weird dynamic, though, between Archon, Immortal, Zealot, Storm, and Lurker, Hydra in general. Technically speaking, both of them hard counter each other, which is really odd. It creates some really crazy moments where sometimes the Protoss army just walks over the Lurkers, and then other times the Lurker armies just kill everything. It's hard to say exactly at what point it tips in either person's favor. Once again, though, that's a big wave of Locusts, and I think they're hunting. They're right-clicked on that Nexus at the same time. Hatchery does fall, but I think the Nexus once more will be picked up, and that's a lot of damage that has been dealt. At the same time, a couple of Zealots here on the northern section of the map. This Hatchery over here is still extremely low. Showtime smelling blood. He wants to get that base, but he doesn't want to overextend too, too much. The Mauer, get it. Just hit it. Just right-click it once. He doesn't want to. He just wants to fight the army instead. I mean, he can always get the yeah. He can always get the kill here on the way out. <laughs> Did you hear that? That was the lower level play right there, and me coming out. Showtime's like Loco, relax. I got this. It's gonna be easy. Ooh, this is interesting. It's a bit of a a swarm host sandwich over here. Once again, man, this night is where I'm over here has been insanely good. Once again, we see the Locust flying past the Bubulus, past the slowing zones. <laughs> splits! He splits them in the air because he doesn't want to lose the Volta Storm. Not gonna happen, though. Showtime's like, you know what? Screw you. <laughs> Showtime actually has been very, uh, very vocal recently about this kind of stuff and about, like, uh, his thoughts when it comes to balance in general. He feels that um, Protoss in general right now is not in that great of a position. I wonder what he's going to feel about the... Uh, or how he's going to feel about the next patch. Ah, there's no denying, though, that Zerk has a lot of different options at their disposal, right? And it's my biggest critique on this matchup. Balance aside, Zerk has, like, 17 different unit compositions you can play. And for Protoss, it really always comes down to Archon, Immortal, Zealot, Storm, right? Like, that's pretty much every single mid-game that Protoss players can play right now. And then usually it goes up towards Stargate. It's my biggest concern about this matchup and why I don't enjoy it as much as, like, say, for example, like, uh, Zerk versus Terran right now, or, or even Terran versus Protoss. Um, I think Zerk versus Terran is much, much better, just because you get all of the units, and they all actually have, like, different ways of opening and playing the game. Okay, nice catch here, though. A couple of Zealots over on the left-hand side of the map. They managed to get a, a nice bit of damage done. Ten drones go down in the northern section as well, another Nidus Worm. This time around in the back of the natural. That's an awkward spot. These Zealots are not going to be able to get over there in time. Um, at the same time, though, the Protoss army right now looking to see if they can morph or move, rather, onto that hatchery. Okay, Zealots do manage to make it uh, make their way in time, by the way. That's pretty sick. But, uh, yeah, with this many lurkers, how are you going to fight it? Like, I feel like if you get a sufficient amount of lurkers out at some point, you're just not going to be able to kill it with, with Protoss uh, ground units. Like, you can maybe outrun it, but that's 25! That's 25 lurkers! Whew. Actually, there's only 39 drones. That's very weird. 39, uh, wait, yeah, 39 drones is very small amount of drones. Normally we see like 75 or so at this point in the game. Maybe 70, maybe 65. But 39 is a very small amount. Showtime is actually slowly but surely dominating the map though. I didn't really like the first 15 minutes of this game very much for Showtime. Yeah, he held on, but that really felt like he, what he was doing, right? Like, it felt like he was holding on. Right now, he's doing a phenomenal job. Just simply outmaneuvering and outpositioning this Zerg army. He's gotta be careful, though. Ooh. He has lost a lot of valuable units there at the same time. Base in the bottom left-hand corner also going down. Nidus Worm inside of the main base. There's a single Phoenix now? I guess that one was just made with the task of killing that Overseer. Fair enough. Hmm. If that Nidus goes up in the main, actually, that could be a disaster. Showtime doesn't have the money anymore at this point in the game to really deal with it. He doesn't have a lot of resources, so he needs to be careful. That is so many lurkers still. Anyways, basically what I would like... I would like there to be a little bit more variety when it comes to Protoss mid-game armies. I know some players have been, uh, you know experimenting with some cool side play here and there, but it's just not as good as this. Like, Archon Immortal Zealot is just simply better. Once again, though, big Locust Wave. Oh, man. He's feeling greedy now, even going after the probes for a little bit before retargeting to the Nexus. The base falls, 
and Showtime is in a little bit of trouble. He's looking to see if at the same time while the Locusts are being utilized on the other side of the map, if he can push into that Zerg army, because he knows that like 50 supply there of the of the Zerg player, 54 actually in total, right? With, uh, with 18 of them, or how many are there? Okay, well, 51 right now, but he knows that a lot of that supply count is caught up in, in, in you know, swarm hosts that aren't gonna fight while the Locusts are on cooldown, but even without that supply count present, you can see Dark still has a really strong army. Like, he's basically at like 110 army supply without the swarm host. So he can basically face the army right here of the Protoss player without even, you know, using like a, a quarter of his army. It's pretty insane. Once again, couple of locusts. Say goodbye to the Nexus. Couple of locusts over here as well. I don't know if that Nexus ever got rebuilt again. Okay, this base over here is now all of a sudden the lifeline of Protoss. This is an awkward spot to be in. Zerk doesn't have that much either, though, right? The worker counts are extremely low. That's a lot of Stormy Boys. Those High Templar can certainly uh, spell disaster. One bad engagement for Dark, one time unburrowed with those Lurkers, and he can 100% 100 uh, be overrun. If these Archons and Storms can land, uh, there's a very easy moment there for the Protoss to engage. Showtime has been looking for it for a while, hasn't quite found it yet. He's in a weird spot though, like he lost the bases on the right hand side, right? Like he doesn't have a lot of economy here anymore either. You know what I would love to see? I would love to see Dark adding on a couple of Vipers right now. You know, you, you know what I would like? I would like to always have a wristband on that says, what would Serral do, you know? WWSD, what would Serral do? I just need an abbrief, maybe maybe just get a tattooed on my, on my right hand, okay? So I glance over at my mouse hand and then I see, what would Serral do? I feel like Serral, at this point in the game, would make vipers right now it's gonna apparently be a spire instead so maybe he wants to go ahead and play some brute lords not a bad choice whatsoever but i really feel like if you can abduct a couple of these units maybe he's worried about the high templar though right like there's a weird dance between high templar obviously and then vipers that's a lot of high templar by the way 10 of them in total huh okay well if there's one unit that has been paying for itself scouting locust wow that's something. <laughs> he's scouting with Locust. Oh, he's seen another base. Is he gonna get that? No way. Don't tell me he gets that. Okay, no, he's gonna settle for a pylon. That would've been something if he actually got that as well. Okay, here we go, here we go. Dark. He knows that his opponent is actually sidetracked for just a little bit. Showtime just slipping focus for a second. Immediately, the Protoss army is caught in a weird spot. Get him! Get the High Templar! Oh, walk! Oh, oh, oh my god! No! No! Oh! Okay, the Protoss in me just cringed so hard. <sighs> that was 10 High Templar finding their grave because they were just wandering around. They're like, okay, guys. We'll come in a little bit. Like, they're like the slots of the Protoss army, okay? Slow and steady wins the race, but not always. Not against Burrow Speed and Lurkers. <sighs> Okay, well, all of a sudden, it is now Dark, who thinks he can just win this game right here, right now. I like this, actually. Showtime making the transition towards Disruptors. Because the Disruptors are really good against this army, but once again, against small, like, small clumps of Protoss, Swarmos are incredible, and Dark never really lost them. Like, he still has them. I thought at some point he may want to give them up, but he's just going nuts. He's got so many of them still available, and they have been... Uh, like, every single swarm house probably paid for the cost of the unit sevenfold. There's a couple of vipers as well. Oh, the Archons get abducted. Dark playing a beautiful game here of Zerg. Not ever really overextending. Good hits there on those disruptors, but it's not gonna happen. Dark just simply looked at it. He patiently waited, and he knew that if his opponent just slipped up in focus for just a little bit, then at that point, it would be game over. So to come back real quick, right? Um, about the tournament format. So like I said, over the last couple of years, with the exception of this year, the top 16 always took place over in the, uh, you know, the state of California, over in Anaheim and then in Burbank, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it was all in the same area. This time around, the European pros had to first off in week one travel over to Korea, and then in week two, they had to be in the United States. So a lot of them were complaining about jet lag already in that first week. <laughs> obviously, that's, I guess, a little bit on them as well, because they could have been there earlier. But obviously, for the Koreans, they only had to travel once. 
But then secondly, um, at least from what I've heard, I heard that like Serral was basically practicing on day one of BlizzCon, which is where the whole top eight was played. The whole top eight was played on just a single day, which is a lot of games. Uh, but he was practicing at like apparently like 9 a.m. And then he had to play his like semi-finals match at like, I think it was like 9 p.m. So it already was a very long day. And you gotta constantly be focused. Maybe if they had like a... A room where the pro players can take naps or something, right? Like, most of these guys, and maybe this is actually a specialty of Dark, right? But most of the uh, top-level pros that are not Korean, they actually don't practice a ridiculous amount of hours. Like, we've talked about it quite a bit, um, and we've talked to the pro gamers about this quite a bit as well. But most of them seem to play, um, well, obviously, pretty much every single day, but maybe, like, two practice sessions of, like, three, four hours each. So maybe, like, six to eight hours, right? Whereas the Korean practice regimen has always been a lot more aggressive. They spend a lot more time, uh, and they just simply grind out a lot more games. So obviously, Dark had to play with very similar conditions, right? Also had to be present there at BlizzCon for most of the day. I don't really know exactly what Dark's practice schedule is like, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is much more known to practice like 12, maybe 15 hours in a day. And those kind of marathon ladder sessions, right, or, or marathon custom game sessions certainly do pay off if you have to play a tournament that, uh, that basically runs from sunrise to sunset. So Dark ended up um, becoming victorious over at BlizzCon. He certainly has deserved the victory, though. But would he win in a best of seven or a best of nine against Serral? I'm not entirely sure. I think especially in the CBZ matchup, uh, I'm pretty sure that Serral would be the one who comes out victorious pretty much every single time. Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button down below. If you want to see more, you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon so you get notified as soon as I upload more. Special shout out to the Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for your generosity. But for now, I want to thank you for watching. Have an amazing day. Do not forget to smile alright, and I will see you once again in the next one.